Good evening and welcome to Gresham College and a very special welcome to anybody who's come here for the first time. Computers are wonderful machines. They perform complex calculations incredibly quickly and these often directly improve the quality of our lives. For example, in the heart pacemakers, which maintain the health of about 3 million people worldwide. They predict the weather so that I could confidently leave my umbrella at home this morning. They fly our planes and they control the Docklands Light Railway train which brought me here tonight. My computer recognises the faces in my, in my photographs and not only organises but also plays my music collection. Computers have brought instantaneous worldwide communications to us and allow me to check the claims that I'm making in this lecture with an ease which would have been unthinkable 20 years ago. And computers sometimes get it wrong. Tonight I shall be looking at why this happens. Some of my examples are deeply serious, others are in more frivolous contexts. Some errors are avoidable, some not so. There will be some mathematics, but I hope that the points can be understood even if the maths is unfamiliar to you. I will try to show some of the insights of three great British pioneers of computation covering three centuries. Neville Maskelyne in the 18th, Charles Babbage in the 19th, and Alan Turing in the 20th. I'm going to focus on errors directly made by computers, albeit originally due to their human programmers or designers. An equally interesting topic, but not one I'm going to cover tonight, is the errors that badly designed computer systems lead us to make when we interact unsuccessfully with them. I want to begin at the time when computers were human beings. In the 18th century, a computer was not a machine, but a human, someone who performed mathematical calculations by hand. At this time, the problem of determining one's position at sea was of vital importance for mariners. Harrison's chronometer was prohibitively expensive for most ships, so they relied instead on the method of lunar distances, which allowed a navigator to calculate their position by measuring the angle between the moon and various stars. Pre-calculated tables for these calculations were published in the Nautical Almanac, and with the help of these tables, it took only a few hours hard mathematical work on board ship to find your longitude. The fifth astronomer royal, Neville Maskelyne, managed the Nautical Almanac. The mathematical calculations required in its production were extensive because the tables had to contain data for several years ahead since they would be taken on shipboard on long, year-long, longer voyages. With no machinery to perform the calculations, Maskelyne employed human computers all around the country to perform the computation for the tables in the Nautical Almanac. Maskelyne well understood that people are not perfect calculators. He worked hard to arrange for the calculations to be as, effect, as efficient as possible, devising algorithms which made the procedure as simple as it could be, minimising the number of steps and the potential for mistakes. But when an error in a table would put at risk the lives of sailors trying to establish their position on long, dangerous voyages, the consequences of human error were potentially very serious. So Maskelyne took another step. He arranged that every computation was essentially performed twice by two different computers, or rather, as he called them, one computer and one anti-computer. A comparer then compared the results. Where the computer and anti-computer agreed, one could trust the calculation. Where they disagreed, one had erred, and the calculation could be redone to ensure that the published table was correct. This check was essential to the safety of navigators using Maskelyne's tables. Maskelyne was well aware of the importance of the check of an independent calculation. So when his comparer 
found no differences at all between the calculations of Joseph Keach and Reuben Robbins. He did not congratulate these two computers on the accuracy of their calculations. Instead, he sacked them for colluding. He believed they could not have avoided making occasional errors, so the identical output indicated that they were working together and only performing the calculations once, and thus jeopardising the lives of sailors relying on the nautical almanac. After this episode, Maskelyne ensured that computers and anti-computers were based on different parts of the country and did not know each other's identity, so collusion would be impossible. So at large scale, distributed networks of computers existed as long ago as the 18th century. Maskelyne's is a method used today for safety critical computer systems. So a fiber wire aircraft might have five different computers programmed by five different teams carrying out the flight calculations. In the event that there is a programming error by one team, the majority vote will overrule the erroneous calculation so the plane is in no difficulty. Uh, there is only a problem if three of the five teams have independently made the same mistake. It's nice to realise that the systems which protect us from computer error in today's safety critical software systems were devised 250 years ago to solve similar problems with a completely different technology. We know that human beings are unreliable calculators, although we can generally get 1 plus 1 and 2 plus 2 right, despite the exceptions in the illustration there. I'm going to show you that sometimes computers err too. I'm going to open up Microsoft Excel, which I should make clear is generally actually a pretty good piece of software, which I would generally rely on. But I'm going to ask Excel to add 2 plus 2. I've actually recorded it to make it thicker. So basically, I've entered in two of the cells the numbers 2 and 2. Okay, I'm going to put a formula in this cell here. Um, I'm going to put the formula equals A4 plus A5. And that's going to add 2 plus 2. So when I hit enter, you'll see the result of the calculation. And it is 5. And that's an absolutely genuine Excel calculation. How does it work if you put them cursor here and see what's actually really in this cell, we're going to find that the number in the cell is okay, it's, um, perhaps we're not going to find that. The number in this cell is in fact 2.3 and what I've done is add 2.3 to 2.3 um, with the result 4.6 and I'm rounding to the nearest integer, or I'm only displaying one digit so um, Excel rounds 2.3 down to 2 and rounds 4.6 4 up to 5. You might think this example is silly, and it is really, but it illustrates a very real problem with computer arithmetic. Computers have a finite amount of storage available for data, and so they can represent numbers with only finitely many digits. If we're dealing with whole numbers, that means there's an upper limit the size of the numbers that can be represented. Let's suppose that a hypothetical computer allocates four binary digits, or bits, to each integer. The digits represent from the right ones, twos, fours, and eights, just as a decimal number, the digits represent ones and tens, so 19 is one ten and nine ones. So, um, a number like 0101, 0110 in binary represents 0 times 2 cubed plus 1 times 2 squared plus 1 times 2 plus 0 times 2 till naught, which comes out as 6. Then our computer is working with 16 different numbers, ranging from 0, which is four zeros, 0, 0, 001 is 1, up to 1111, which represents 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, which is 15. Now, what happens when I add 1 to 1111? This is adding 1 to 15, and if you do the sum, much the same way as we do it in decimal, except that 1 plus 1 equals 10, we get 1000, zero, 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 which is 16. But remember, only four bits are available in the computer, so what the computer actually stores is only the last four bits, 
the leading one drops off, and the result is zero. In fact, this is actually rather convenient, because it gives us a good way to represent negative numbers on the computer. Since 1 plus 1111 gives us zero, it makes sense to regard 1111 not as 15, but as minus 1. And similarly, 1001 represents minus 7 rather than plus 9, because if we add 1001 to 7, we get 0. In general, this means that the first digit of our binary number can be regarded as a sign bit. It is 0 for positive, 1 for negative. So there's an easy hardware test for whether a number is positive or negative. So our imaginary computer with four bits now represents integer, integers as follows. They range from 0 up to 7, beginning with 0 in the left-hand column, and from minus 1 down to minus 7, the seven numbers beginning with 1. Of course, real computers use more than four digits for each, by, each integer, and thus represent much larger numbers. The first computer I ever programmed used 16-bit words, which meant that, because 2 to the power 15 is 32,768, um, it could represent integers between minus 32767 and plus 32767. Today's computers generally use more bits and can work with larger integers. And this convention, or this two's complement arithmetic, works well for arithmetic. So multiplication works. If you multiply, for example, 5, which is 0, 1, 0, 1, by minus 1, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, we do it 1 times 0, 1, 0, 1 is 0, 1, 0, 1, and we shift it as we do in decimal, add them all up, and when we look at the last four digits, which is all the computer will store, it is 1, 0, 1, 1, which is minus 5. So 5 times minus 1 is minus 5, and if we're not convinced, as an exercise, try multiplying minus 1 by minus 1 and see if you get 1. So computer arithmetic works, but what happens if I add, say, 6 to 5? 6 is 1, 1, 1, 6 is 1, 1, 0, 5 is 1, 0, 1. When you add them, you get 1, 0, 1, 1, which is, in my computer, minus 5, because the first digit is a 1. So my computer thinks that 6 plus 5 is minus 5. The addition has overflowed into the sign bit. And we have the wrong answer. Basically, 11 is too large a number for this computer to handle. But overflow is a real problem for fixed word length integer arithmetic on any computer. The dangers of overflow are shown by a rather dramatic example from a very early computer chess tournament. Chess playing computers estimate how good they think the position is by evaluating a number which is called the evaluation function, which is positive if, if the machine is winning, and the higher the better, and negative if the machine thinks it's losing. In this particular tournament, one competitor early in the game thought it had a very strong position. In fact, it thought its position was so strong that the evaluation function overflowed and became negative. So in order to maximize the evaluation function, the computer now began to fight to look for the worst move it could possibly make, and it um, lost the game. Computers generally check for over overflow when doing calculations, but that incurs overheads. Basically, the machine is doing extra checks every time it does a calculation to make sure no overflow has occurred, and that slows down the arithmetic. So overflow is a problem with computer arithmetic, but it doesn't explain why Excel said that 2 plus 2 equals 5. For that, we have to see how computers represent general numbers, not just whole numbers. So a simple fraction, like a half, could be represented by regarding our four-bit integer, which takes values between minus 7 and plus 7, as the numerator of a fraction with 8 as the denominator. So this way, our 8-bit word can represent positive or negative fractions between 1 8th and 7 8 
So in this table, we see that the positive values of the um, from 0 to 111 represent 1 8th up to 7 8th, and the negative ones represent their negatives. The arithmetic is consistent. If you multiply half by half, you get a quarter. And we can now implement floating point arithmetic on our computer. In base 10, we often write a decimal number like 12.345 as 0 0.12345 times 10 to the power 2. We call it scientific notation. And in the same way, our computer stores two parts for general numbers, the mantissa, which is a binary fraction between minus 1 and plus 1, and the exponent, which is a binary integer, positive or negative, which is the power of 2, by which we have to multiply the fraction to get the number we want. For example, the number a half will be represented by mantissa 0, 1, 0, 0, and exponent 0, that represents a half, a quarter would be 0, 1, 0, 0, with exponent minus 1, because we have to divide a half by 2 to get a quarter. And 5 would be 0, 1, 0, 1, with exponent 3, because 0, 1, 0, 1 represents 5 eighths, and we have to multiply it by 8, which is 2 to the power 3, to get 5. The problem is that we have only finitely many bits available to represent the mantissa and the exponent. And that's particularly a problem for the mantissa. Although computers work in binary, I'll demonstrate the principles using decimal numbers because the principle is the same. The decimal expansion of even a simple fraction like one third is infinite. It's 0 0.333 going on forever. If we're only able to store up to six decimal places, the best we can do would be 0.333333, which is probably close enough for practical purposes. But if we add this number to itself three times, we get 0.999999, which is definitely less than one. It's less than one by one in part in a million. So if you ask somebody doing arithmetic in this way, whether three times one third was equal to one, the answer would clearly be no. The error in representing a number in a computer is called rounding error or truncation error, depending on whether the computer hardware rounds the final digit to the nearest integer so that 1.9 would become 2, or simply loses digits it cannot represent, in which case 1.9 drops down to 1. Rounding or truncation error is a problem. Typically, we store the matissa of our numbers with enough bits to represent them with sufficient accuracy for practical purposes. But when we add two numbers, we potentially double the rounding error. It can accumulate, and when our mathematical software for an application like weather forecasting performs millions or billions of calculations um, to solve partial differential equations um, to produce the weather forecast, the rounding error can quickly accumulate, even though the individual error in each calculation is tiny. The discipline of mathematics called numerical analysis is, in large part, the study of how to organize machine computation to minimize the effects of rounding error. Numerical analysts look for ways to reduce the number of calculations to avoid, as far as possible, the accumulation of small errors, and to arrange the calculations in such a way that rounding error is minimized as much as possible and that the effects are mitigated. Neville Maskelin was actually doing very much the same thing in the 18th century when he was specifying calculating procedures for his human computers. An example, which is probably apocryphal, of the effect of rounding error is the story of the programmer who was writing software to add interest to bank accounts. The interest calculation rarely resulted in an exact number of pence. The programmer added an instruction that the fractional part of the interest was added to his own account every time. Nobody lost more than a fraction of a penny. The bank's balance sheet added up, 
But since he was gaining tiny amounts of money from a very large number of accounts, the programmer became very rich. So computer arithmetic can go wrong. Nevertheless, especially when the effects of rounding error and the other consequences of computer arithmetic are understood and mitigated, computers are better at computation than we humans are. This was the motivation behind Charles Babbage's attempts to build calculating engines, starting with the difference engine, which he proposed in 1822, and later with his analytical engine, which in many ways anticipated the digital computers we use today. I'd like to comment today particularly on Babbage's farsightedness regarding the interaction between human and machine. People make mistakes in calculation, but they make other mistakes too. We misread things. When Babbage published books of mathematical tables, he was very much aware of this. He experimented with different colours of paper, believing people make fewer mistakes reading numbers from coloured paper than from white. One of my mild regrets over the years is that I didn't buy, when I was offered it, um, a rare copy of an edition of Burnside's Tables, which is printed on yellow paper. It was very expensive because in this particular copy, the pages hadn't faded and they were still yellow and most other copies had. So to avoid human transcription errors, Babbage designed his engines to include printing as an integral part of the machine. There was no need to transcribe the numerical output so that the tables produced by his engines would exclude human error not only in the computation, but also in the production. What else can go wrong with computer mathematics? Suppose I'm using a computer to study a sensitive piece of industrial equipment, like a nuclear reactor or a chemical plant, or to fly an aircraft, or to control railway signalling, or to administer drugs to a critically ill patient. These software systems will all be based on the computer's implementation of an underlying mathematical model of the process. In any of these examples, a computer error could have life-threatening consequences. The model is built from mathematical equations. These equations can be solved by a mathematical algorithm, a possibly very sophisticated procedure which manipulates the data to obtain a solution. I program the computer in high-level programming language like C++ or Java in order to implement the algorithm. A piece of system software called a compiler converts my high-level program into low-level binary code, which the computer can execute directly. The computer runs this code and thereby generates data representing the solution of the equations. I can then draw conclusions from the computer output or the computer can make decisions on the basis of these solutions. So what can go wrong? Well, at each one of these stages, there are opportunities for error. First of all, my model may not accurately represent the real-life situation. Here's a piece of mathematical modelling by Mark Twain. In the space of 176 years, the lower Mississippi has shortened itself 242 miles. This is an average of a trifle over one mile and a third per year. Therefore, any calm person who is not blind or idiotic, can see that in the old Orlytic Silurian period, just a million years ago next November, the lower Mississippi River was upward of 1,300,000 miles long and stuck out over the Gulf of Mexico like a fishing rod. And by the same token, any person can see that 742 years from now, the lower Mississippi will only be a mile and three quarters long, and Cairo and New Orleans will have joined their streets together and be plodding comfortably along under a single mare and a mutual board of aldermen. There is something fascinating about science. 
Well, Swain's mathematics is correct. I say, I say that, I haven't checked it. Um, but his model of a linear change in the length of the river over time does not accurately represent the real situation in the long term. So however correct his analysis based on this faulty model, his conclusion is not valid. Secondly, the computer may not solve the problem correctly, may not solve the equations correctly. In my opinion, it's not sufficiently appreciated that mathematical algorithms, even when correctly implemented, don't always give the right answers. So I'd like to explore this for a moment. Sometimes we can check. Suppose we're trying to solve the equation x squared f of x equals 0, um, a standard equation. We might use the newton raphson method, which is a very fast algorithm that solves equations of this form. If the computer tells us that y is a solution of the equation, we can simply evaluate f of y. If it is non-zero, or a line for rounding error, not very close to zero, we know we have a problem. Suppose, for example, we're trying to solve the equation f of x equals x squared minus 4 equals zero. If the computer tells us that a solution is x equals 2.001, I can do the calculation and find that f of 2.001 is 0 0.004001, which may or may not be sufficiently small to convince me that the solution is correct. We're not saying it's the only solution, and that's another issue. If the computer tells me that the solution is x equals 1,000, I can calculate f of 1,000, and I find that it's 999,996, which is almost certainly not zero for my purposes, so I know that the solution the computer has produced is wrong. So sometimes we can check, but sometimes we can't. Many mathematical models are built from differential equations, which are equations of the form dx by dt is a function of x and t. Essentially, although usually we're working in many dimensions, we're given a curve, and we have to evaluate the area under the curve. As human beings, or if you have a sufficiently sophisticated computer, we might be able to find the exact mathematical formula for the solution. But for many modeling situations, the equations are so complex and have so many discontinuities that we cannot find such a formula. If we did have a formula, we wouldn't need the computer to solve the equations. So how do we know that the computer's answer is correct? Solving a differential equation is difficult because the equation specifies a rate of change that is generally itself changing all the time. If the rate of change were constant, then we could simply multiply it by the time to get the change in the dependent variable over that time. If I travel at a constant 30 miles per hour, after 10 minutes I've gone 5 miles. But if my speed is constantly changing, it is very much harder estimate the distance travelled. So for example, let's use Euler's method, which is a simple but sound method for solving differential equations numerically, to solve the equation dx by dt equals minus kx. Equations of this form arise very often in mathematical modelling, and the solution from fairly straightforward maths is x is a constant times e to the minus kt, where the constant is the value at time zero. We can plot this, and we see that the value will decay to zero over time. The larger k, the faster the value approaches zero. Euler's method for approximating the solution of this equation is to take a series of small, small steps of size h, the step length, and to assume that the rate of change doesn't change over that time. So the formula is that x at time t naught plus h is x at time t naught plus h times the derivative f of x and t at time t naught. Okay. So we can try this. Um, let's take the equation dx by dt equals minus x, which has solution x equals e to the minus t. I've used Excel to do this with a step length of 0 0.01, no, sorry, of 0 0.1, and so, even with quite a large step length, we see that the true solution, which is the continuous line, and the approximation, the dotted line, 
are pretty close. So let's try another one. Let's try the equation dx by dt equals minus 1,000x, which has essentially the same form. This time, the solution is x equals e to the power of minus 1,000t, and that appears in the graph. The red line is a function, and you can see that it goes down to zero very, very fast, and then stays at zero. So for all practical purposes, the solution to this equation is zero throughout. So we'll solve it as before, using Euler's method with step length 0 0.1, and this table is what we get. And if you look at the numbers on the right-hand side, you will see, first of all, that they alternate in sign. It starts at 1 goes to minus 99, 9,801, and secondly, they get very, very big. So after time 1, it suggests the solution is 9 times 10 to the power 19. Um, I can't plot it for you because basically the last figure is so bigger, much bigger than all the others that you get a straight line and then it shoots off to infinity. So we have an approximation which is oscillating and getting very, very big to a function which is essentially zero all the time. So this is definitely not the right answer. And in this case, we could get a good approximation by taking a very much smaller step length. It would have to be very much smaller the math is not difficult to check these things out. Um, but a very much smaller step length means that if you're working with a large system, the cumulative rounding error in the rest of the system would be greatly increased. This particular problem is called stiffness, and it's a very real problem in mathematical modeling. We are essentially putting a huge computational effort into calculating something it is actually really zero for all practical purposes. This example shows the difficulty we have when we cannot check that our computed answer is correct. There's no obvious indication, apart in this case from the very silly numbers, that anything is wrong. And if the spurious solution were plausible, it could easily mislead us. These problems are not just theoretical. Here's a cautionary tale I was told when I began my career in mathematical modeling many years ago. A new power plant was being built. It's not this one, and it's not in the UK, but I like this picture. Um, and a detailed mathematical model was commissioned. The model predicted that in some operating conditions, the boiler pressure would not be constant, but would oscillate. The engineers had never seen this kind of behavior in real plant. They suggested that these oscillations were an artifact of the mathematical solution of the equations, much as in the previous example, and that they weren't real oscillations that would really happen if the plant were built. The mathematicians weren't convinced. They were familiar with spurious oscillations, and these, the period wasn't quite right. They didn't. They didn't feel they were spurious, but they couldn't persuade the engineers. So they resolved the matter by looking at other models. Other models of the power plant existed. They tried out the scenario. All of these models showed no oscillations in the boiler pressure. So obviously, they were a spurious construct of the mathematics. And the engineers went ahead and built the plant to the original design. But when the plant began operating, it turned out the oscillations were real. The new mathematical model, which had correctly predicted them, was now used to find a fix, and the problem was easily resolved. But the question remained, why had none of the other models predicted these oscillations? So the software was examined in detail. And it turned out that every single one of these models had included a subroutine called something like smooth or filter, whose job was to detect and remove these oscillations when they arose in the computed solutions. So every previous modeler had noticed these oscillations, and every one had assumed they were a numerical error rather than being real. And I would argue that nobody did anything terribly wrong in this story. Numerical methods do sometimes introduce erroneous features which are not present in the real system. The modelers were, in principle, right to follow the judgment of experienced engineers in concluding that these should be filtered out. 
although the outcome in this case was the incorrect rejection of what turned out to be real physical behaviour, all of those involved had made sensible professional judgments. So using computers for complex mathematical modelling is very far from straightforward. So we've seen in our discussion of stiff equations that a correct algorithm, correctly implemented, solving the correct equations may still yield an incorrect solution. But there are other potential problems. I have to specify my model and my program and program my, alg my algorithm in a high level language like C++ and I may make errors in doing so. Even if I get my program right, the people who program the compiler that translates my program into machine code, the code the computer can execute, may have made errors. So my correct program may be turned into incorrect code. Since, com since compilers are generally very widely used, any such bugs are likely to become apparent quickly and be corrected, but they do occasionally occur. Finally, the hardware itself may not execute the program correctly. It is said that the term bug for a computer error arose when the pioneering programmer Grace Hopper found that her program was malfunctioning because of a dead insect in the computer circuitry. But it can also happen that the design of the computer chip itself is faulty. In 1994, it was found that the Intel Pentium processor had a design flaw, which meant that when it was doing division, very occasionally it got the, it got the answer slightly wrong. Hardware bugs, as in the Intel case, or bugs in compilers and software like Excel, which did at one point have a bug in some multiplications, are rare and generally have little noticeable, noticeable effect on the accuracy of practical calculations. However, the consequences can be serious in other ways. Adi Shamir is the S in the name of the RSA algorithm, the Rivest, Shamir and Edelman algorithm, which is the primary encryption algorithm used to guarantee the security of data we send over the internet. It's what protects our credit card numbers from interception when we shop online. The RSA algorithm is mathematically secure. I'm simplifying a bit here, but essentially, we know that in principle, it cannot be broken. However, if you're using RSA on a computer with a hardware bug in its arithmetic, Shamir has shown that your secret key on which the security of your encryption depends can easily be found by an attacker who knows of the bug. So that bug compromises your security. So apparently trivial hardware or software errors can have very serious consequences. There is one other issue for any mathematical modeler, and it's an aspect of chaos theory known as sensitive dependency on initial conditions, or perhaps the butterfly effect. This came to prominence about 50 years ago when Edward Lorenz was working on modeling weather systems. He had a fairly simple model with 12 variables, and on one occasion, he wished to replay a simulation from part way through. He typed in the values of the 12 variables as recorded high accuracy in the middle of the previous run, but the replay went entirely differently. The values printed were rounded from those held in the computer, and a very tiny difference in the values of these variables led to big differences in how the simulation unfolded. And many nonlinear mathematical equations behave in this way. Since we can rarely measure physical constants um, to um, more than a few significant figures of accuracy, if our system is chaotic like this, we cannot know which behavior is correct, so such systems are inherently unpredictable. In this sense, the weather is chaotic because we cannot predict more than a few days ahead because tiny unmeasurable changes in the data lead to different long-term consequences. Another example of a chaotic system is a double pendulum. Um, here we have a pendulum which has two, um, well, one pendulum with another hanging from it, and I'm about to release it from the top here. 
and you will see that the motion is quite curious and interesting. And gradually it slows down and eventually it will end up swinging more or less as a single pendulum. And if I run it again from as close as I can get to the same starting position, we will see similar things are happening, but not quite the same. So I, I can try to release it from, from exactly the same position twice, but the second behavior diverges very quickly from the first. Although the equations of the motion of the double pendulum are well understood, we can't predict its precise motion because it is so sensitive to the tiny differences in the starting position. So we've seen that there are very good reasons why computers go wrong when they do mathematical calculations. But what else do computers do? I want to look now at one of the classic texts on computing, the 1950 paper by Alan Turing on machine intelligence, in which he proposed what we now call the Turing test. Turing argued that a sensible test of a computer's ability to display intelligent behavior is to ask whether it is capable of holding a conversation with us so that we could not tell whether we were chatting to a human being or to a computer. Here is a hypothetical conversation from Alan Turing's paper in 1950. No, it isn't. Sorry. Please write me a sonnet on the subject of the fourth bridge. Count me out on this one. I never could write poetry. Add 34,957 to 70,764. 105,621. Do you play chess? Yes. I have king at my king one and no other pieces. You have only king at king six and rook at rook one. It is your move. What do you play? Rook to rule eight, mate. This is a remarkable hypothetical conversation to which we will return. Remember, Turing is writing long before today's computers existed, when computers were used for calculation, when input and output were through switches, lights, and teletype. When I was at school, my friends and I were fascinated by the idea of a computer playing chess. This was long before access to chess playing computers was commonplace. Chess seemed to us to be one of the greatest tests of the human intellect. Would a computer ever be able to beat a strong human chess player? In 1968, David Levy, who was a strong but not outstanding player, had made a bet with various computer scientists, eventually worth 1,250 pounds, that no computer would beat him within 10 years, and he won the wager. Chess is a difficult game for computer programmers. The number of possible moves is so great that calculating all possible moves far ahead requires an enormous amount of computer time. That's not the way humans play chess. Computers could be programmed to play other games, which are perhaps simpler. It is in that gammon that a computer first beat a human world champion. Hans Berliner's program BKG 9.8 um, beat Luigi Villa in 1979. It was an interesting match. While the computer played well, experts thought Villa had played rather better, but the match was short enough for luck to be a significant factor. The decisive game hinged on a straight race in which Villa had a large advantage, but the computer rolled 31 pips more than Villa over 12 turns, which is pretty good dice throwing, in order to reach a position where it had a 20% chance of winning. It then threw a double six to secure the win, so computers, like humans, can be lucky on occasion. But chess seems to be a game of pure skill that leaves no room for such luck. 
And it was not until 1997 that a computer beat the world champion in a chess match when the IBM supercomputer Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov three and a half, two and a half. Deep Blue had enormous computing power with 30, 120 megahertz microprocessors working in parallel. It could evaluate 200 million positions in a second. So was it Deep Blue's sheer computational power which beat Kasparov? Well, a recent book by Nate Silver has given a rather interesting account of the match. In the first game, Kasparov had gained a winning advantage. Deep Blue, on his 44th move, had an opportunity to prolong the game, but instead played a rather poor move, which, eased, which made it easy for Kasparov to exploit his advantage. Kasparov was puzzled. How had such a powerful computer made such a mistake? Kasparov deduced that the computer must have been capable of looking so far ahead that he could see that the apparently better move would still lead to defeat, and therefore had chosen the other move as possibly making the game last longer. So Kasparov deduced that Deep Blue was searching potential positions much further ahead than he had previously imagined. In the next game, Deep Blue gains an advantage, and this time, on the 44th move, Kasparov checked, and Deep Blue had a choice of two king moves. He played the one which left his king more exposed. This seemed to offer Kasparov an opportunity to play to force a draw by perpetual check. And in fact, post-match analysis showed that he could have got a draw had he done so. But to the surprise of all spectators, Kasparov didn't play that way. In fact, he resigned the game. Why? Well, he thought he knew from the previous game that Deep Blue could calculate far enough ahead to see whether or not there was a perpetual check. Since Deep Blue had permitted that line, Kasparov deduced that he couldn't force a draw, and therefore that the game was lost, so he resigned in what was, in fact, a perfectly drawn position. The next three games were then drawn, with Kasparov thoroughly demoralised, and in the sixth and last game, Kasparov made an early blunder and Deep Blue won the game and the match. So at last, our computer had beaten the world's top human chess player. So was this the ultimate triumph of machine intelligence? Well, if Nate Silver is right, the critical moment was Deep Blue's 44th move in the first game, when it played an apparently weaker move. Had Deep Blue, as Kasparov thought, looked so far ahead that it could see no difference between the outcome of the apparently better move and the one it chose. Well, no, there was a bug in Deep Blue's program. So it had played a poor move in error, in an already losing position. But by assuming this move was intentional, Kasparov overrated his machine opponent's ability to see ahead. And as a result, he threw away the second game and was so demoralized that he underperformed in the remaining games and lost the match. So in this reading, Deep Blue won, not through outstanding artificial intelligence, but because of a programming error and Kasparov's resulting misanalysis of Deep Blue's capability. And we said there was no luck in chess. I'd now like to return to Turing's hypothetical human-computer conversation from 1950. Remember, this did include a chess problem. In fact, Turing's test, text presents a fascinating view of what computers can and possibly can't do. They do arithmetic, that's perhaps the obvious thing they're good at, and unlike human beings, they usually get the right answer, unlike the respondent in Turing's conversation. If Turing's lines are being spoken by a computer, it's also clever enough to display a human ability to dissimulate. Computers can play chess, but Turing's conversationalist doesn't write poetry. And as far as I know, no computers have yet been candidates for Nobel laureateship. As a teenager, I thought that playing chess was a ultimate test of intelligence, artificial or human. I now know better. Computers were playing good chess long before they were able to carry out what I once regarded as much more primitive human operations, like understanding speech and recognizing faces. It turns out that these abilities, which are so, so routine for us humans, 
that we don't regard them as signifiers of great intelligence are much harder for machines to, than playing chess or predicting the weather. As somebody who is reasonably good at chess, but embarrassingly bad at recognising faces, this should not really have been a big surprise to me. In 1999, I was discussing human-computer interaction with students, and I quoted an e-book on the difficulties of language processing by a computer. I recall that I said, following the authority in the book, that I did not think that a computer would be able usefully to recognise human speech within my lifetime. That same evening, I met a friend whose elderly father had suffered a stroke a few months before, and he was no longer able to type. She said he was very depressed three months ago when he thought he could never write another book, but then he got speech recognition software, which worked so well that he's just sent a new manuscript to his publisher. So I like to think I've really had my predictions confounded quite so quickly as that. But recently, a computer-generated caption on a TV news programme told us that Michael Gove wanted to back a lorry out. And that's a remarkably sophisticated error for a computer to make. Uh, a few years ago, we would never have imagined our computers being able to make that kind of error. We are now in a world in which computers process speech routinely, if not always accurately, and recognise faces and photographs with considerable accuracy. The algorithms they use are often very different from the mathematical algorithms used in numerical computation. They are fuzzy, they learn from experience, they get better given more data. This means that when they go wrong, there is no single cause of error. If the face recognition system identifies a photograph of me as Leonardo DiCaprio, it actually isn't very easy to work out why it should think that. And these new computer abilities are going to be increasingly important. There has been talk of security cameras which will recognise known troublemakers. The picture on the right shows a system under development which is going to identify hostile intent from people's body language. If a computer mistakes you for a hooligan, you may not be allowed into a football ground. If it matches your appearance to that of a terrorist, or infers hostile intent from your body language, you won't be allowed through airport security. If the computer can't recognise the signature on your cheque, it won't be accepted. These decisions are based on complex algorithms, which match patterns and resist line-by-line -line analysis, so that when these mistakes occur, we won't be able to identify specific errors in the software, and the consequence of computers having the power to make such judgments could be serious for the unlucky few. It's relatively easy to correct an erroneous bank transfer, but if computers automatically misidentify one's face as that of a terrorist, it may be much harder to restore normality to one's everyday life. The changing nature of computer errors will have interesting implications for us over the next few years. The history of errors is an important part in the history of computing. So far, computer errors have usually been programming errors. We have learned that we humans are not good programmers. We are good at giving instructions to other people whose understanding of the context means that ambiguities are resolved and many errors are corrected subconsciously. The invention of programmable, programmable computers has made explicit that while we are very good at giving instructions to someone like us, who will use the context to understand our intentions. Specifying instructions in precise, low-level detail is a very unhuman activity. As computers have developed, we have learned more about what it means to be human. As a result, we are much more aware of the complexity of everyday procedures like understanding speech and recognising faces. In these and other new applications, new kinds of, human er of, of computer errors are going to arise. Now that computers are beginning to match us in these activities which are more fundamentally human than calculation and binary logic, I'm sure we're going to continue to gain new insights into ourselves, not least from the mistakes these computers will undoubtedly continue to make. 
So thank you for listening. Um, I'm very happy to take questions now. If you have any comments afterwards, um, please post them on my blog. Thank you.